just while we're doing this, um, I'll, I'll just uh, tell you a few things about the jury. Um, we were a mix of writers, teachers, makers, um, deeply professional and deeply committed people. But what we all shared is that we're film lovers. And when I say film, I'm talking about all the platforms. We were in unison on many of our decisions and had a lot of very interesting discussions. There were no stalemates, there was no stonewalling, everything was discussed. It was one of the best juries I've ever served on in terms of engagement. And I also really want to thank the R's team that supported us. It was impeccable. Um, it was one of the best experiences I ever had, so if you can ever get on the jury here, enjoy it. Um, the other thing that made it easy for us, and this isn't just because it's animation, um, because people think animation is funny, and you in the room know that that's not just the case. It can be very profound. Um, but there was a lot of humor and irony and um, really extremely complex observations made by everybody. I'm going to plug the book. If you want to know more, ours does something really amazing. Every year they publish uh, a jury statement and details about the jury um, decisions in an annual book. Uh, I, it's, I, don't, I think it's a pretty good deal, but for the content, it's priceless. And you can read more about all the films in all the categories and find out how the juries work as well. And I, I would really recommend it. Right, so we were left to decide our own criteria. Uh, we know what ours is, what their artistic philosophy is, um, their innovation. So we agreed a main criterion, and that was if a film can touch someone's emotion, aesthetic senses, intellect, and or sense of humor, or any combination of these, then it works. Our decisions, and this is very important, I think, are based entirely on the film's merit. It, we did not consider production values. We didn't consider if someone uh, had already won an Academy Award or not. We didn't consider their art world position or their artist background. So a few facts. The, of 775 films that were submitted, we were, and I really thank the pre-selection jury, we were given 177 to consider. Um, there was a range from experimental works and installation adverts to game promos, <clears throat> film trailers, and puppet animation. What surprised me, um, I ran a, a founded and ran a film, film festival in Switzerland for 10 years called Fontosch that's still amazing, was that there were very few entries from well-known artists of the three subcategories. And I think it's partly because people are intimidated by ours. They think what they do is just animation, and it's not. <laughs> So think about that and go home and t tell your friends and the people you know that they should submit. I mean, it's not fair to the pre-selection committee because then they'll have 1,200 films, but the more the better. We also noticed there was a low number of high-quality games-oriented or commercial works, which was a bit puzzling. Maybe it was just this year. Most films had an experimental quality, and we had more discussion, this discussion actually, because experimentation breaks rules and makes new ones, and that's the point. So some of the tendencies and commonalities that we noticed were an increasing blending and merging across all three categories. We couldn't say which was which sometimes, and this has also uh, got to do some other things that we observed. Almost all of them used digital technologies. There was also a tendency towards a narrative sensitivity and also to non-narrative playful abstraction. This was a really great joy um, to, to experience. Many of them had thematics of human nature and experience. Um, what I've often noticed over the years is animation years, uh, animation festivals usually do have competitions every two years, but you observe a certain kind of political, cultural um, theme that runs through it. It's been global migration, war, youth alienation in the past, and we didn't really notice one uh, in terms of human experience. But um, what we did notice was a shift towards clinical exactitude that we thought was probably the result of a push for realism that we're all observing everywhere. And what was really a pleasure for us, uh, I don't know how old some of you are in here, but I remember the first flying cameras and the thousands of films you'd watch that all use the same programs. And what was great about this um, uh, selection was there was a translation of very complex data sets, big data, 
which is a buzzword at the moment, into understandable, aesthetically brilliant, and highly conceptual forms. That last word is important, forms. <laughs> So we watched all of the films and at, at the start, and if one of the five jury members wanted the film in, it stayed in. We didn't start discussions there. Um, the second round was where it got intense. We had really deep discussions about each work's qualities, and what we noticed then were permeable distinctions between each juror's personal sensitivities and professional priorities. We were a range of everything from academic scholars to people who are on, on the field in R&D, but also in commercial productions. And this is where we learn so much from each other. This is, if you're lucky, that's what happens on a jury. Uh, and the basic different, what we also noticed was the basic differences in disciplines of art and design, where art explores problems and conditions of the human, and design attempts to solve these problems. That was a kind of division we saw, but it merged. And this was a stage where a lot of really worthy projects were excluded. So the most intense debates were during the first two days, which meant that the final decisions were, for the most part, unanimous. Um, or to, when they were democratically decided, we, that was also something we agreed if three people wanted it and two didn't. There were a few kind of crocodile tears and a very, very funny, continuous, oh, from Tomek Baginski, <laughs> when, he, when he had to let something go. But it was, it was very, very um, unanimous, or, or we all agreed. So the overall observation, which is the title of our jury statement in the book I just showed you, is A Quarter Past Human. And it borrows from T.G. Bass's 1971 sci-fi novel called Half Past Human, about cultural genetics where, human, where the human feeds the machine. In this pre-ours category, we thought that the human still prevails over technology, and that was a really ethically heartening thing. So before we move on to the top three, prize winners, the distinctions, and the, the golden anika, I'd just like to briefly show you um, just a few images from some groupings of, of I think, could, what could stand in for what the, the submission was. I also want to thank ours for letting us do this. It's quite rare that a jury is allowed to say more than just their, um, uh, the, the, the statement that they write for each award. And I think it's really helpful for people who are trying to understand you know, why these films, uh, how we got there, because we're all just human. So, <clears throat> what we noticed, there were a lot of films that were installations, and this raised questions about the art world. Is a film made for an installation? Is it a commission? The difference between short film animation that's meant for cinema and screens that maybe doesn't make it into the art world, and this is a debate that I think we really need to start having. So, <clears throat> if we could just look at an image from Under an Alias, they're alphabetical here, so sorry about that. <laughs> Just an image would be fine. I think you can go and look at all of this on the ARS website. That's why I'm not going to go through it in very much detail. Uh, Under an alias was a, an architectural inst installation on a building in Weimar done by a Turkish collective called Nerdworking. And what's really interesting about it, and it's, it's something that you're seeing more and more of, is interaction, using animation, digital... Uh, imagery on works of architecture. And uh, we'll maybe hear a little bit more about that later. Okay, if we can't get any images, go to the website and you'll see it. I'll just m m keep my comments really brief so we can actually move on to the reason that you're here. Okay. Um, that's fine. Um, under an alias, the other was Ars Rata, uh, which was a film that worked with we couldn't tell until we read later if it was a real room it was in, and then there's a, a, an object that is playing with the limitations of physics and explodes. And it, 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 it's a beautiful installation, and it's something that um, we awarded because it constantly transformed a reflective sculptural, sculptural meditation on volume, space, and light and it both aligns to and denies physics. So if you're thinking about form and structure and how, what we believe, it, this also was one of the, uh, the works that worked with um, a real push to realism. We also have so-called animation. That's also a very troubled word. I'm not gonna go into much detail about right now. Um, and I guess four of the films um, that we awarded uh, honorary mentions to, you could call animation. Uh, one was called Roland Safari. It was 
just simply hilarious, but it, we didn't just award it for that. It's quite simple animation, uh, but the idea. And as we all know, animation, you can have a, a narrative that makes no sense with a live action with actors, but you can do anything, really, in an anim animation film. Pelampidarium um, looked like a, a, a very kind of classic, nostalgic almost, um, desaturated 2D animation. And we awarded it partly because of the way they used the animation for the narrative. Ball Pit, um, we had quite a discussion over Ball Pit. And it was really clear who knew the histories of, ex of experimental film and who didn't. Um, we learned from each other again. And we thought that it was a really amazing exercise in the animation of physics taken to the extreme that made, paid homage to Norman McLaren, but also to Fischke Weiss in a certain way. <clears throat> and it, it shows what imagination in animation can do, um, working with the idea of a child in a, a ball pit, a sand pit. And then the fourth one was Carousel Family, which is, if you know Alfred Jarry, <laughs> this film will appeal to you. Uh, it, it's an absolutely bizarre film that we thought worked also with diff cultural differences. Um, another trend that we kind of noticed was um, nature, bio, art again. And there were three films uh, in the honorable mentions that would you could kind of fit together. One was Snail Trail by Philip Artis that actually started as a laser installation um, in a garden. And we awarded it um, because it Basically takes, actually I'm not going to tell you in case you see it, I don't want to spoil it. But, but part of, partly what they did with nature, how they used animation to do that, a choreography of grace that has a reminiscence of William Kentridge's charcoal progressive drawings, if you know how his work uh, functions. Shelter from Carl Burton uh, was also given an honorary mention. Burton did an MFA at UC San Diego, and I saw his MFA film about five years ago called Drift, which is absolutely stunning. He works at a molecular level. In Shelter, he goes out into a, a wooden kind of attic-like cosmos, and because he, he worked really beautifully with digital natural light and um, palpable textures that we know, it was like being in an attic and having a hallucination. So it was a really beautiful film. And we also gave an award to um, Andrew Hang's pop promo for Bjork called Mutual Core. Um, that I, per no, I'll stick to the jury. I won't be personal here. We thought that it made you, you, you wanted to take, you could taste, feel, and smell um, this film because it works with strata of organic, inorganic material. But it also made me really thirsty, <laughs> if that makes any sense. And I just want to end on to what I would call personal films, Subconscious Password from Chris Landreth, who Chris is, is really one of those brilliant people who takes his neuro neurosis and makes it into art, and he's very open about that, and we awarded that um, for its self-irony and for the way that he, again, uh, did some pretty significant sea changes with digital um, mastery. Um, and then, the f I think, I will say something personal. If I could award uh, a fourth prize, I would have given it to, um, uh, sorry, Don Housefield's It's a Beautiful Day that he's now put together as a feature. If it comes to a cinema near you, go and see it. And I would put him in a category with Stan, Brackage, uh, Stan Brackage's Dog Star Man and Hollis Frampton. It's an epic of human experience. I'm not gonna spoil it again in case you can see it, uh, and works at an absolutely kind of what you would consider a rough, raw, almost 70s, eight millimeter aesthetic, combines photography and stick figures to tell probably one of the most moving epics about human experience that many of us have seen for a long time. So that's me. Um, there's, I don't think there's any questions. If you have any questions about the jury or you want to argue with me about anything we chose, I'm happy to stand in for all the five of us after. So I'd move on now to Dooku Space Marines um, presentation. And I'd like to, I'm going to do first names, if you can introduce yourself with the rest. We've got um, Alice, Nicola, we have another Nicola, and Hugo on the side. There's four of them, and they've uh, democratically decided that two of them are going to make the presentation. So can I invite you up 
to give you a presentation. I think what we agreed, all of us, was that first of all, you'd see the film, and then there'd be the presentation after.